can you hear us okay? In the back, yes. All right. Well, my name is Katie McKee. I'm a professor of English and Southern Studies at the University of Mississippi, and I'm the director of the Center for Studies of Southern Culture. And I'm happy to be here with my colleague Robert Colby to talk about his wonderful new book. Um, I just said to Robert when we came in, how long have you been here? Three years? Four years? And he said, I'm at the end of the second year. <laughs> so I think that's really just a sign of how quickly he has come to feel like a valued colleague. I feel like I've known him for much longer than just that. But it's, just, it's an accomplishment. He's coming to the end of his second year here as an assistant professor of history at the University of Mississippi and as the associate director of the Civil War Research Center. So we're going to talk about his book today. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what is Kate doing up there? Because <laughs> she's not a historian. That's, and I want to make... I want to underscore that, not a historian. Robert and I have two things in common. Um, the first is that we like to talk about the 19th century, which is actually not that common, <laughs> really, to see conversation with people. And the second is that we both went to UNC Chapel Hill for school, for our, our graduate programs, at not exactly the same time. <laughs> I mean, a couple years apart. Don't laugh that hard. <laughs> I was here last week for... Um, the, the lovely conversation between Afton Thomas and Amy Nasuka Matato. And you'll remember that there were um, cocktails made by Joe Stinchcomb and special treats that were available. And um, this we're not having that this week in the 19th century. <laughs> in the conversation about the 19th century, uh, we're going to be having some hard tack and steady water. <laughs> so stay tuned. So first, Robert, I want to say um, this is a is a an impressive uh, a, a, a massive book, an enormous accomplishment. So congratulations on the book. <laughs> and on the one hand, it's a book with a limited time frame. It's covering five years, basically. I mean, we're talking about the Civil War, but it also helps us understand so much about how we get to the moment of the Civil War and so much about how we get to the moment of today, in which there are plenty of echoes at that time. So it is constricted a little bit in its time frame, but so deep in the amount of research that he's done for this book, in the geography of the book, you're all over the South, all over the country, really, but all over the South in the book. You're in Texas, and then you're in Georgia, and then you're in Mississippi, and then you're in Kentucky. So the sweep of the book is really impressive, and I think um, lots of you are going to enjoy it. Enjoy is not quite the right word for the subject matter, though, because it is a heavy book in that way, that we are talking about the trafficking of human beings during the years of the Civil War. So having said that I know something about the 19th century and like talking about it, it's odd to share the next thing, which is that a few years ago I was in a, a book club here in Oxford, and we were reading a book that was set during the Civil War, and one of the plot points in the book was of the sale of an enslaved person. And I can remember turning to someone in my book club and saying, that was happening during the Civil War? I mean, I don't know why we would have ever thought that it stopped, but what we see from this book is the incredible, healthy dedication on the part of so many people to maintaining the institution of slavery. So I think the first thing I'd like to ask you about, Robert, is to talk a little bit about why we don't know more about this period of time. You address that in several places in the book. Why don't we know more? And by we, I think I might mean white people in particular um, in the 21st century. And as part of that, can you talk about who is selling and who is buying people during the Civil War. Sure. Um, well, so let me, before before I answer that, um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, it is it is remarkable um, to think that we have been here less than two years, and yet um, there's so many people who are, who are willing to take time out of what is a very busy season at the university and in life generally to be here. And so um, I, I'm deeply grateful to everyone who's, who's come out this evening. Um, and thank you as well, Katie, for uh, in interlocuting uh, during exams week, uh, which is 
not the ideal time to take on any additional tasks. That's so, good for uh, procrastination. <laughs> Am I breaking things now? No. Right here. We could be doing longer. Could be uh, so, so why don't we we'll, we'll take those questions one at a time? Why don't we know more about this? I, I think there's a couple of reasons. Um, there is a long, the, the the history of the domestic slave trade was a history that um, scholars took a long time to uncover. Uh, it was really only in the last 25 years or so that the people have begun to, to pay it serious attention. There was a lot of fraught discussion amongst academics about, well, did it, not did it exist, but was it really significant? How, how large was it? Um, and only really in the last 25 years have, have historians of, of enslavement really concluded, yes, this was something that took place on a large scale, was critical to the institution of slavery, and is arguably the key to understanding American slavery as it functioned. So in terms of scholarly attention, the slave trade itself is, is a relative late time, right? And then in the Civil War, there's just so much going on. Um, there are so many uh, critical issues of you know, mustering up armies that are comprise hundreds of thousands of people, mobilizing resources for war, the suffering that war inflicts, and of course the, the, the larger story of emancipation that takes place during the war. And so um, in none of those stories does the slave trade feature prominently, I would say. It's, it's not the central aspect of any of those stories. But what I found in writing the book is that it's, it's present and it's part of all of them. Um, it's not always sort of the star player, but it's always in the background, it's always operating. Um, and that meant that, uh, and I'll just, without going too far down the archival rabbit hole, it was a very fragmented book to write. There were very few large um, holdings that, that dealt specifically with the wartime slave trade. And so the book was very much a project of, you know, finding one letter in a collection of 200 that talked about um, the decision, a family's decision of whether or not to purchase people, or one interview an enslaved person did with a journalist in a, in a stack of newspapers. And, and there, you know, I, th I think often about the book as a, sort of a mosaic. Um, there are a lot of tiles out there, but they're not all in one place. And so it was, it was really a, a work of archival recovery. So the second question, um, I, which I think is a, a really good one, and it's the question, I'm sorry, um, it's the question, I, I don't do this with a microphone or seated very often. Um, uh, the question that I got constantly as I'm starting the project and, and that I get the most is, is, yeah, why in the world would someone buy or sell an enslaved person during the Civil War? And I, I think there are kind of two, there are two major logics that dictate this during the Civil War. One is one of continuity. It has to do with um, white Southerners, Confederates went to war to preserve slavery. And they expect that the war will do exactly that and will allow them to sustain sort of the slave-based economic and social system that had pervaded before the war. So that there's an expectation that a victory in the Civil War will allow that to continue, right? And the second has to do, though, with all of the small changes, or not so small changes, the war imposes on individuals as it unfolds. Um, which is to say, the war gives slave trading a logic of its own. Um, and people experience enormous hardship during the Civil War, feeding their families, clothing their families, managing, um, managing their, their plantations, and, and so forth. And one of the, as this becomes increasingly difficult, for example, there, there are any a number of other examples we could give, that dictates or, or encourages or incentivizes, might be the better word, people to either offload enslaved property that they can no longer use properly, uh, profitably, or to acquire other people. And so there's almost a logic that exists independent of the war or that has to do with how people project the war's outcome. But then there is there are any number of transactions that are that are deeply enmeshed in the events of the war. Um, I think I was really struck by, um, well, I like the, the way that you're describing the book as a mosaic because there are so many different small stories you were stitching together, but also that you had to become, I wrote down all the different kinds of historian I think you had to be. You had to be a historian of business. You talk a lot about slave commerce and a lot about how the trading of enslaved people was big business. We see in the literature of this period, the slave trader is often sort of a disheveled bad guy, but you're talking about Uncle Tom's Tavern. Mm -hmm. um, what 
but here, the, the, the big business of it, the, the, that is really striking. So you had to become a kind of historian of commerce. You had to become a historian of political movements also, right? You talk a lot about how the state is supporting the institution of slavery, that, that Southerners can depend upon their individual states, but also the idea of the, the political state to support. And then you also had to become a kind of geographer, it seemed to me, because the differences that you're pointing out between the way slavery is working in coastal locations and the way it's working in the interior is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about, um, about your work <coughs> in each of those facets? So that was to review. That was as a, as in the, a historian of the economy, a historian of the political state, and a geographer. Well, I, that's that's a very generous way of describing what I do, um, especially given there are people who actually do all of those things in the room. Um, I, I would say I had to learn just enough about all of them to be dangerous. But, but that's where. But that, I think this again this speaks to this 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 question we or this idea we've kind of already raised, which is to say that I think the the number of different things that I had to take on I won't say master but take on in in, in writing the book right reflects how pervasive. This, this commerce in enslaved people was during the war that, you know, um, couldn't just restrict it to one area, for example, have to, and, and, had to, and you have to understand what's happening throughout the entire, I, was gonna, I, I often say Confederacy, but that's not entirely true. There, there's slave trading in um, parts of the United States, or rather slaveholding states like Kentucky and Maryland and Missouri that remain loyal to the United States. Um, and, 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 you know, I, if, if if we want to add to the list, right, we have to talk about military events. Yeah. Um, I, to, uh, I have to talk about economic trends. I have to talk about, um, and, and of course, being the, uh, the complicated literature on emancipation. Um, and so uh, I say these things not to, again, not to make any claim to total expertise in, in any of them, but to uh, make the case that the wartime slave trade is really important, and it touches every person who is in the wartime South, whether or not really they actually engage us in many cases. Um, I'm not, there was one place where all of this kind of came together for me. I was going to read a short part of a paragraph and, and then ask you to comment on it. Um, this is way deep in the middle of the book. And you say, the effort to birth an independent slaveholding republic, republic <coughs> sparked massive social and economic changes. Yet at the heart of these labor pains rested a conservative enterprise. Fundamentally, white Southerners went to war to preserve enslavers near total authority over their human property and the backing of slaveholding states offered. As a result, they devoted considerable efforts to maintaining the legal and social structures that had long sustained slavery, even in the midst of their revolutionary project. Indeed, to the degree that they understood their efforts as radical, it was in reforming and strengthening slavery for the future. So that really caught my attention, the idea of investing in the institution of slavery as a futuristic project. So can you talk a little bit about that? Where does this faith come from that, 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 this, is, that this is the ticket to the future? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and I, I would say that it reflects the reality that on the in, in the in the decades leading up to the Civil War, the presence of slavery had become interwoven in almost every strain of the fabric of Southern society. That it had become a religious question. Um, many of the churches divide along North-South lines over the issue of slavery. Uh, it was clearly a deeply political question. Um, political parties are, are riven over slavery. Um, and But there's, it had become even bound up with larger questions about what the United States was supposed to be. Um, I, was, I was teaching uh, Andy Lang, who teaches in Mississippi State, has written a great book on the sort of ideas of the nation in the Civil War, and, and argues that the Civil War, really, what it really represents at its root is a conflicting ideas about what the United States is supposed to be. And those people who become Confederates understand the, uh, the ideal... Um, or the, the purest form of the American project is as a liberal democracy, to be sure, but one that's constrained and, and almost oddly purified, made most effective by the presence of slavery. Um, and so, uh, you know, what, what I'm trying to get at in, in the passage you just read is that 
the, the, the goal of establishing the Confederacy is to create an independent slaveholding republic, one where slavery will be safe for the future, and one where, um, you know, this, this takes different forms at different times and is weighted differently in um, the minds of different slaveholders, but where it can be practiced in its most ideal form, you know, almost might say, there, there, there's, been, there's really fascinating literature on Confederate uh, reformers uh, who basically say, look, once we win this war, this is our chance to get it right. Um, but also, it, it, you know, it, that's sort of the idealistic version of the future. But there's also a deeply economic version of the future, which is to say, um, when many people, when they look at the future, they look at the reality that the prices offered for enslaved people. Um, and one of the realities, oh, we haven't actually said this yet, right? But one of the realities of American slavery is that an enslaved person, a person held in slavery, is a person with a price, is both a person and an economic asset at the same time. Uh, sometimes those ideas are in tension with one another, but they always exist at the same time. And as an asset, the, the market price, the prices offered for enslaved people, had climbed steadily for the 15 years prior to the Civil War, to the Civil War, um, to the point that many people thought there was a bubble uh, that, what we were a bubble that was going to pop, right? And so that future project has um, idealistic, has democratic, has arguably religious overtones, but also has a strong economic overtone. That when the Confederacy, that the main threat to um, the economic future of slavery, at least, is the rise of a Republican, explicitly anti-slavery political party that will eventually constrain it, kill it. But that once an independent confederacy is established, that will no longer be a threat. And slavery's future for years, if not generations to come, will be secure, um, both as, again, as an ideological project and as an economic endeavor. I think as, as much as anything that I have read, your book helps me think about this exactly, the idea of the, the of slavery as the, base, the economic base of an entire society. And while it does not in any way create empathy if, for slaveholders, what it does show you is it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money mm -hmm. they're spending. There's a lot of money they're investing. And to lose this institution that's at the base of your whole society is to lose the money. There are people up until the very end, I was just it was astonished by this, there are people up to the very end of the war who are buying people for the future. And I wanted to see if I could get you to, to say more about something that you and I said when we were just talking here a few minutes ago, about how we read history, how we do history. Because I look at that person and think, what's the matter with you? The, this thing is, uh, this war is over. This is, it's done. What are you doing? It's March of 1865. But that's not what was, that's not within that person's head. So talk about how to see, how to see this. Yeah, and, and I think that's, it's uh, absolutely critical and to, to the point that, right, I've, I've been doing professional history for a long time, right? And, and I, it's still, the temptation is still from, from our perspective to say, it's March 1865, the war is going to be over in a month, and, and what are you doing? But they don't know that, right? And, and it's, it's such a simple thing to say, but it's, it, it is profoundly true whether, you, I mean, to a greater degree when you're talking about a period right at the end of the war. But really through the entire conflict, that, that much of what happens during the Civil War doesn't make sense if you look at it from the perspective of someone sitting here in, in 2024, right? Where we know what's gonna happen, where we know the Confederacy is gonna lose, where we know that uh, there will be uh, a 13th Amendment that ends slavery and, and not, right? The original 13th Amendment, which would have preserved slavery. Um, we, we know what's gonna happen, but none of the people who we have to, have to, to wrestle with as, as authors of history, they don't know what's going to happen, and so to the best that we're able, we have to put ourselves in their shoes if we really want to understand what they're doing and the choices that they make. Um, and so um, that was, that was, I think, a major part of, um, I don't think it's, it's not terribly profound, but it was one of the major sort of intellectual exercises of, of writing this book was to constantly remind myself, okay, they're at this point, they don't know, you know, inflation is about to go through the roof, or they don't know that the Confederacy is about to lose this battle, and so forth and so forth. Um, I mean, it's an easy thing to say, but a really hard thing to yeah. remember. 
And, and you know, sometimes it doesn't even matter. One of, one of the moments I, I was most struck by in, in, in writing this, um, where one of these historical actors came pretty, you know, you love it when they actually come close to saying what you, I don't want to say need them to say, but what, you know, to actually clearly expressing what's happening so you don't have to do as much reconstruction. So there was a slaveholder in Virginia, and in, in the beginning of September 1864, he fought a person. And he wrote to, I want to say it's his brother, but I don't remember specifically. Uh, in, the, in the time between when he had purchased this person and when um, he wrote this letter, the city of Atlanta had fallen to William T. Sherman's Union forces, which is, which is an absolute hinge point in the war. It, it's, it's a critical blow to the Confederacy. It basically guarantees Lincoln will be reelected president and that the war will be prosecuted to its conclusion. Right? And he writes this letter and he says, if I had known Atlanta had fallen, or if I had known Atlanta was going to fall, I probably wouldn't have bought this person. And then he turns around, and like two sentences later, he says, but when we go and buy people next year, this is what we want to do. And so there's a certain amount of, like, there are people who reckon with events in the moment, but there is also a certain amount of, again, like, you know, we, again, sitting here, we know that Atlanta pretty much ends the war, but they don't. And, and bearing that in mind, uh, I think, is, is critical to understanding and, you know, to, the, to having empathy and just understanding what's going on, what, what, what the people we study, what the people we read and write about are doing. Well, one of the things that you do in the book that I really appreciate is periodically stop and create a vignette of people doing things, people with names, people in a moment, like a little story. So, of course, that appeals to me. Um, could, would you... Would you read a little bit from? Sure. Um, I, 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 sure, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, this is all spontaneous. This is, this is <laughs> so much fun. We talked about this maybe a couple hours ago. Um, but uh, so I would say, yeah, with, the, with the caveat, it's hard to isolate any, any part. But I'll, I'll just read a, a relatively short segment um, to give you maybe a taste of what the larger book is like. Um, on April 26, 1861, a boy named Nelson departed Hector Davis's Richmond jail. Unlike most of those who exited the pen, Nelson did not face a lengthy trip south. His journey covered only a few blocks to the slopes of Shaco Hill and the city's African burying ground. Nelson had come to Richmond three weeks earlier, sent to Davis for sale by his enslaver, J.J. Payne. He arrived with an older man, also named Nelson, and a woman named Melinda, and while they were not the only people Payne sent to Davis that month, it seems probable that they represented one of the many families cast adrift into the slave trade. The Richmond into which they entered was in turmoil. The very day of their arrival, Virginia's secession convention rejected disunion by nearly a two-to-one margin. In the ensuing weeks, during which they sat confined, the guns barked at Fort Sumter, Lincoln called for 75,000 troops to put down the rebellion, and white Virginians cast caution aside and embraced disunion. If secession fever raged beyond the walls of Davis' slave pen, other pestilences pervaded within them. Slave jails were notoriously virulent. Not long before, the famous fugitive Anthony Burns had found Robert Lumpkin's jail more foul and noisome than the hovel of a brute, filled with loathsome creeping things that multiplied and rioted in the filth, a perfect breeding ground for disease. Throughout April, Dr. Robert Cavill, Davis' preferred physician for tending to his human property, was a regular presence in the pen. Among those he tended were both Nelsons and Melinda. These ministrations did little for the elder Nelson, who succumbed on April 22nd. Davis failed to record his malady, but noted the $7.25 it cost to bury him. That same day, the trader bought medicine for Melinda and the younger Nelson in the hopes of preserving the money their lives represented. Cattle returned two days later to treat Melinda, but with little effect. On April 26th, the pair received drafts of brandy, a stimulant considered capable of, revive, of resuscitating patients in dire straits. The gambit likely failed to revive Melinda. She disappeared thereafter from Davis's accounts and did nothing for Nelson. The boy's final appearance in the historical record came in the form of the $3.50 Davis billed paying for his burial, precisely the sum he had spent only recently on shoes and clothing to aid the boy's sick. So this, this happens periodically in the book, where we stop with the sort of march of history and talk about people as people. One of the things that you say that you, you want to do in the book, and that I can see you working to do in the book, is not to just tell the story of enslavers, but to try to capture something about the, the people at the center of the book. Can you talk a little bit about how you went about trying to do that? 
Sure, um, and, and I'll say it's, it's a real challenge and it's something that, that historians who work on the subject of slavery are, are constantly wrestling with. Um, I'm fortunate to be working at a moment when uh, the the archive or the source base that we use to write about slavery is, is probably as, as capacious as it ever has been. Um, I was able to draw on um, sort of well-worn sources like the narratives recorded by the Works Progress Administration in the 1930s, uh, also on newspapers, uh, which thanks to the, the miracle of the internet are, are as available and searchable in ways that they were not before. Um, and to a, to, to, a, in a, to a surprisingly large degree, enslaved people gave interviews to journalists during the Civil War, and so we have some of their own works. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau, the, the government agency were created to, um, to help people trans transition from slavery to freedom, also gives us a, a large a number of descriptions of the enslaved experience of the war. But, but even so, for the most part, what we have to do is we have to work backwards. Um, we have to work backwards from things like Hector Davis's account book, which give us nothing uh, of the thoughts that Nelson or, or Nelson or Melinda had. Um, we could go on and talk about any number of other people who also died that month, um, courtesy to uh, a slowdown in the slave market that, that kept them in his jail longer than they would otherwise have been there, probably. Um, and so I, 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 I can only say I try to be very careful um, I try to be very careful in not assuming that I know how someone felt, uh, that I know how someone processed the experience of the wartime slave sale. Uh, I think sometimes we can draw approximations uh, using published slave narratives of people who had similar experiences uh, and, and can sort of make educated guesses. But um, for the most part, I, I, it was a work of, I, I tried to do, I did my best, I think, to, to try to um, respect those experiences by reconstructing them uh, as painstakingly as I could um, and not interjecting myself where I could not. But, I, but it, it is a challenge because most of the records that we have that deal with this, these questions were created by slaveholders. Uh, so we have their perspective, we have their emotions, we sometimes have the emotions or the sentiments they project onto the people they enslaved. Um, and so we have to, I think, have to parse those very carefully and, where possible, try to get closer to the voices of the people. We talk a lot about, when we talk about the 19th century, the second half of the 19th century, the romance of reunion, mm -hmm. the, the how did the North and South come back together? How did they come back into a kind of national marriage that will let us move forward? We talk about, we see that in novels of the period where Northerners and Southerners are marrying each other. These are all about about white people who are doing this thing. I think your book gives a whole new level of meaning to the that phrase, romance of the union, because you talk a lot about how, toward the end of the book, how once emancipation has, has truly come, people try to work their way, formerly enslaved people try to work their way back towards each other. So can you talk a little sure. bit about, about that as a kind of ending point for your story? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so, so uh, a large part of the last chapter of the book does deal with uh, formerly enslaved people's efforts essentially to repair the damage done by both the pre-war and the wartime slave trade. Um, and one of the things that the, the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, in addition to other groups, missionary organizations, uh, re religious entities, one of the things that they do uh, is they try to essentially reconnect black families that had been separated prior to or during the Civil War. Um, they work through sort of the governmental bureaucracy. They, they publish ads in periodicals. Uh, you know, they, they talk about, they go to churches and just make announcements to sort of, does anybody know this person or know what happened to them? Um, and it's, it's a really, it's a really powerful process uh, in, in, in often, they are often successful. Um, one of the things I, I always wonder is how does anyone in the 19th century ever find anybody? Um, but they do, right? Uh, without you know, without cell phones, without without phones, so it's sort of mail that takes several days, even weeks, to get from one point to another. They do find people, and, and they are able to reunite families, or at least partially reunite families in some cases. Um, but more often they aren't. Um, the, the number of letters amongst the Freedmen's Bureau that come back and say essentially, well, we tried, but we got no response, uh, is, is really striking um, and, and re really, really heartbreaking when you come across these. Um, I will say, I, I think 
it made it, I, I, I mostly chose to stop at that point because I think it speaks to uh, one of the challenges in, in, in ending this book is, um, so what does, what does emancipation actually mean? Um, what, does, what does freedom mean and what effect does the warp slime slave trade have on it? And, and I, I think I, I chose to put a foot kind of in, in multiple camps, um, which I, I, I'm gonna allow myself to do. Uh, in the sense to say that um, on the one hand, the end of the domestic slave trade absolutely defined freedom in many cases for formerly enslaved people. Uh, when they describe what the end of the war means, what the war brought, what emancipation has done, often the first thing on the list is they say something to the effect of we can't be bought and sold anymore. And that the removal of the, um, again, that, that dual status of person and property, the removal of the property portion of that status is arguably the most transformative thing that the Civil War does. On the other hand, the, and, and this is where I think the ongoing separation of these families speaks to it. There are, the slavery does things that cannot be healed, that cannot be rectified. And that no matter how hard the Freedmen's Bureau tries, no matter how hard uh, private aid entities <coughs> try, they can't put back together or can't fully put back together things that had been broken. And when we talk about, uh, without going into sort of a larger conversation about what is freedom, which is you know one of the central questions Civil War historians wrestle with, if we're thinking about any conception of freedom that people would have understood at the end of the Civil War, family integrity would have been a part of that. The ability to support oneself would have been a part of that. And without sort of a whole nuclear family, missing fathers, missing mothers, missing siblings, it's very hard to say that freedom unfolded as fully as it could have and or should have. Um, and so this sort of, I, I think I had to leave the book in sort of that ambiguity, um, which I think is maybe more honest, but is also more difficult uh, to do as both, um, as both a writer and as a, as a person who likes neat endings, which I think most of us do. Yeah, we do. That, this is not a story that has one of those. There are several really um, riveting tales though, in the uh, of reunion or, or near misses in the last part of the book, and you will have to buy it and read it to find them. <laughs> so maybe we see if there are some questions from the audience. I'm just wondering if towards the end of the book, I know you're only covering a short period, do you go into the romantic, romantic, romanticization of the, um, the South and Confederate, Confederate South? And if your book doesn't go into that, can you, can, can you speak to how they try to do a repair work of the image of the South afterwards? Like, it's way later on, but like Gone with the Wind, that idea that you have of like, this is what Civil War, pre-Civil War South was like. You know, I, I, I don't, um, partially because my editor gave me a word count, and, and partially because um, there, there, there has been so much that is, that is truly excellent written on that already that I didn't uh, feel the need to retry their ground. The, the, only, the one thing I will say that I, that I think I do say that speaks to that is um, one of the things that I do try to talk a little bit about is why does the wartime slave trade and the slave trade in general get forgotten so quickly? Um, which I think is, a, is partially a question of serendipity. Um, that is to say, uh, many of the people who would have made very attractive sort of villains in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War uh, die uh, and don't simply are not there to be sort of targets. Other people, uh, some of the, I, I spend a lot of time talking about the, the people who are slave traders in Richmond. Many of them just sort of quietly fade into obscurity and are no, literally no longer present on the landscape. Uh, the, um, with the removal of the slave trade, there is no incentive to preserve the physical structures that would, might remind us of, of the slave trade. There are a handful that are still there. Um, uh, there there's a, a relatively intact facility in Alexandria, Virginia, for example. But for the most part, these buildings get quickly repurposed uh, and either and their original, their original role is forgotten, or they are torn down. Um, 
Much of the, the Richmond slave trading district, for example, uh, is under I-95. Um, and so uh, you can visit one of, the, one of the sites that I talk about in the book, but only a corner of it is not under a giant retaining wall, for example. So, so it's literally no longer present on the landscape in many places. Um, and the, the, the sort of the rehabilitation or the distancing of slavery from the slave trade had begun before the war. Um, and that continues after the war as well. Um, so that, that's, that's as far as I get on that particular question. But there, there's a really rich literature on the romance of reunion um, and reconciliation. And I'll just throw in from the side. I think it would be impossible to read your book and think that the Civil War was about anything other than an attempt to preserve the institution of slavery and the massive capitalistic investment of the United States in it. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the romance gets shut. If there's any, there's no the romance. Gets shut down. <laughs> um, Robert, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the the ongoing slave trade within the Confederacy and the sort of Confederate States military commitments? How are how are those two things uh, are are those two things in conflict at times, especially as the war gets uh, as the Confederacy situation gets more dire? Yes, uh, that's a great question. So you're talking about the so the the tension between the surviving slave trade and the the demands the war places on the Confederacy. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think there's there's two answers to this question. Yes, they are in tension, uh, but also the survival of the slave trade helps individual. So on a, on a macro scale, yes, those things are in tension, which is to say. The Confederate government demands more and more and more of slave holders and of its population writ large as the war goes on. Um, the Confederacy is basically totally mobilized for war by the end of the conflict. Every resource is being poured into uh, keeping the country the country on a war footing. 80% um, of the military aged men are in the service. Um, so yeah, the, the, so as, a, as on that that demand for resources has has an impact on the slave trade, um, and the there there is there is conflict in the Confederacy as a sort of larger slaveholding enterprise and what it asks of individual slave traders. So I think about uh, a letter I, I came across from a slaveholder from Lynchburg, Virginia, to the Confederate Secretary of War. The Confederacy regularly impressed enslaved laborers, essentially took them without sometimes paying for them, uh, to do things like build fortifications or repair railroad lines and things like that. And this individual wrote to the Confederate Secretary of War and said, basically, I'm sick of you impressing these people. If I find out you're going to do it again, I'm just going to sell them because I don't want to deal with the headache. I'm afraid of losing them when they go to a fortification close to Union lines. I'm done. Right? So there is a tension there. Right, this, this larger project that is designed to protect that investment does actually threaten it in some ways. Um, the Confederate Army is both the most important thing in preserving slavery and an absolute agent of chaos, whenever it actually, wherever it actually is. Um, the flip side of that, though, I will say, is that um, the survival of the slave trade, the ability to buy and sell people, also helps Confederates deflect some of the pressures that the war places on an, indiv on, on an individual level. That is to say, if you know the Confederate government has um, conscripted or impressed uh, your food, and you cannot feed the people you enslave, the easy answer is to sell some of those people, for example. Uh, similarly, if uh, to, th that's sort of the basic uh, answer. You see versions of that, um, different versions of that a lot. So there is a tension, but kind of oddly, Confederates also try to address that tension <coughs> through the slave trade. Okay. Um, I'm intrigued by this idea that the Southerners, we're not aware that they're going to lose the war. I mean, I, I think 1863, it's clear. But, but 1864, Atlanta, and then by Christmas, Sherman's in Savannah. Mm -hmm. And it would seem to me, it would be very clear. So the question is, um, the slave trade in 1865, were prices going down? Were people unloading slaves? Or was, was it... They're pretty clear. This is going to end. I might as well cash in now because I'm not going to be able to cash in uh, after Appomattox. 
That's a great question. Um, I will say this is where it's hard to paint with a totally broad brush because there certainly are people who by that point have thrown in the towel um, and know that it is over. Uh, by the same token, I remember being struck by a letter I read fairly late in the research process where uh, a soldier from Virginia basically says something to the effect of, well, we've lo yeah, we've lost Atlanta and Savannah and Mobile and, you know, lists three or four other places. And he basically goes, but none of those matter because we're going to win anyway. Um, right, so, so th there's a degree to it, and, and you know, I, I can't explain that except to say he, he believes this, right? Um, the slave trade has declined pretty severely by the time you get to 1865, partially because so much of the Confederacy has been carved away, uh, partially because the reality of emancipation is looming, and partially because the Confederate economy is in an absolute freefall. And uh, so, so the Confederacy, right, we, we think we have bad inflation at, at 3 to 4% a year. The Confederacy experiences 10% inflation per month for most of the war. And across the entire span of the war, the Confederacy experiences 7,000% inflation. And so it becomes very difficult to do business in anything with that sort of economic turmoil. And so... I, you know, I, I will say in the letters that I read, I rarely saw people um, completely giving up on slavery, but it becomes impossible to do business in almost anything uh, by the end of the war, um, especially when no one, because no one will take Confederate money. There's no one will do it, right? So unless you have, there, there are examples in Texas of people exchanging enslaved people for land or livestock, for example, that happens. Um, but by the, by the last few months of the war, the Confederate's ability, Confederacy's ability to do business in almost anything has ground basically to a halt. I will add that this book is supplemented by a lot of really helpful images, cartoons, things from newspapers, but also a lot of maps that show how, sla how slavery is moving at different moments in the war, how people are moving. It's very detailed. I mean, how, does it, how, are, how are things moving in 62 versus 63? Versus, so it's this, this sort of attention to how a different individual moment of the war matters from the next moment that the book is really careful to do. Laura? Um, I'm curious about, in the midst of the war, um, men are going off to fight. Um, are you fi were you finding in your research examples of female slave holders writing letters, mm -hmm. doing the trades, doing all of that? active in the process? Yes. Um, so there, there's a pretty, there's an ongoing debate uh, amongst historians of how involved were women in the slave trade before the Civil War, um, and increasingly the evidence seems to be fairly. Um, but during the Civil War, as you say, I, I, I said this a second ago, but I'll say it again, 80% of the military aged men are in the military by the end of the war, which means you have a lot of women left uh, behind at home who are uh, I, there's a there's a letter from a, I think it's a Georgian who says to his wife, "You will have to be both the husband and the wife now," um, and that includes dealing with enslaved people um, on a scale that women had generally not done before. And so uh, you see this cutting in a number of different directions. Um, in some cases, women sell enslaved people whom they believe they cannot manage or control. Um, in other cases, they acquire people because there is a labor deficit and they need someone to work in the fields or to cook or to clean. Um, and so that's, I, I think it's a pretty stark example of the ways in which the survival of the slave trade allows people to adapt to the pressures of the war as they experience them. But yes, that is absolutely a factor. <coughs> Julia? Sorry. Um, 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 so the kind of idea of the slave trade continuing, continuing under the conditions of the Civil War, I feel like, I mean, of course, all of it, uh, every economic condition involving slavery makes you do kind of like a blood-curdling map. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering, like, you talked about people thinking 
sure I understand your question. Um, the, uh, so uh, the short version is I would say it's everywhere, right? Um, and that is, in many cases, I think the hardest part about studying slavery as an institution, I, I just finished, or I'm finishing, I guess, when I get my exams on Thursday, uh, a class on the rise and fall of American slavery, right? Um, and one of the things that I've been trying to hammer into my students this semester is that when you study slavery, you have to be able to hold contradictory ideas in your head at the same time and to just accept that people do not act in ways that are consistent, right? Uh, or do not act in ways that are consistent with how they express themselves. And that both of those can actually reflect what they think to a certain degree, if that makes sense. Um, it's a long way of saying people are complicated. Um, but you know, I, we've been talking about sort of the economic value of enslaved people. And, and I think it's worth stating that um, on the eve of the Civil War, enslaved people are worth about $3 billion, that's like $1860. Um, uh, the average enslaved person is worth between $800 and $1,000, which is, I haven't calculated it since our last round of inflation, but it's probably somewhere between $30,000 and $35,000. Um, we're talking about a significant amount of money. Uh, enslaved people are worth more than anything else in the United States, except for land. Um, more than all the money in the banks, all the railroads, all the stocks on Wall Street, so forth and so on. So we're talking about an immense amount of money, and you can certainly say like this is this is a determining factor, right? And, and it explains a very great deal. Um, people don't always act economically rationally. Um, and so you have people frequently acting in ways that seem counter to their economic interests, or at least as we understand it. Um, you know, but I, I will say compared to other books, I, I found the economic explanations hard to get away from. Um, slaveholders regularly weigh the human cost. It's not the only cost they weigh, but it's, it's, it's a major one. Um, and I'm happy to talk sort of more about that. We have one more question. We've been patient here in the second one. Hey, Robert. Um, could you talk maybe about the North's perception of this? Like, mm -hmm. when New York threatens to secede with the Emancipation Proclamation and the Second Sectors, how does the North at large, and then maybe some pockets, view this Southern view of the slave trade, you mean? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, so that. It actually, I think, said, has a lot to do with sort of that, the question of like, how do we remember it? Why, why, are, why is it remembered versus forgotten? Um, the domestic slave trade had played a major role in the abolitionist literature uh, that circulates prior to the Civil War. Um, it is probably the most damning indictment that many abolitionists lever, lever or sort of deploy against the institution of slavery. Uh, it's incredibly effective. Um, I, I don't know how many people have read, for example, Uncle Tom's Cabin, or, uh, one of the best-selling books of the 19th century. But the, the crux of the plot right, is that, is that Uncle Tom and several other enslaved people are sold from Kentucky to Louisiana, separated from family members, um, separated from their homes, things like this. So it's an incredibly powerful critique. But not everyone sort of buys that that's reality. Uh, in the same way that right, we think the media, we look at the media and talk about bias, right? People in the 19th century do, except for the bias is more explicit, right? The newspaper often has it baked right into the title. And so uh, there are plenty of people in places like New York who look at the slave trade and say, well, it's not as bad as Harry Beecher Stowe is talking about. There's some people who are like that, but not everyone. Most people are, are, are good and kind and so forth, right? So th th there's a fair amount of ability to just brush it off. Um, there is a, uh, it also, it doesn't necessarily loom that large in their minds. Um, fundamentally for most white northerners at the beginning of the Civil War, the war is not about slavery. And so, you know, even if they, it's about, it's about preserving the Union. Now, preserving the Union might involve getting rid of slavery, and many people sort of buy that argument. But it's not the thing they're thinking the most about. And so when, to the degree that the slave trade, for example, shows up in northern periodicals during the war, it's either as part of an abolitionist critique or it's in some way sort of deriding the Confederacy. Um, Confederates like to make a big deal about how high the, the nominal prices are offered for enslaved people. 
And union newspapers like to say, well, you do understand how inflation works, for example. Um, so it's there as sort of a, 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 a mode of discourse, a mode of commenting on how the war is going. But it, it just doesn't loom that large outside of sort of the critiques abolitionists raise. It's a great question. Robert, it's an important book. Thank you for reading.